Hey, everybody. Welcome to the book leads impactful books for life and leadership. I'm your series host and leadership performance coach, John Jeremello. This podcast series is about getting to the books that have impacted the lives and the work and the business of people in my network, uh, people that were there at the start of this podcast, people that I've met along the way. So it's an extended network and I'm appreciative of that. Uh, so these are great leads, these interviews on books. I want to learn what are the books, whether they've read them of other authors, if they've written them themselves, if they published it themselves, that have impacted their work, their lives, their businesses the most that stand out. If you ask them, what's the one book that kind of stands out, that guides your, your values or really stands out in terms of building success in your life and just value. So for this series, I have three types of books that I cover. The first category is books that my guests share with me that I haven't read. Second category is books that we've both read, whether specifically for the series or in our past lives. The third category is when I have authors and or publishers come on to share the messages of the books that they're written, that they want to get out to the audiences that are out there. So today I will have an author on, and my guest today is retired Lieutenant Colonel Oakland McCulloch. Oak is a nationally recognized keynote speaker and the author of the 2021 release, Your Leadership Legacy, Becoming the Leader You Were Meant to Be. Both his leadership presentation and his book are based on his 40 plus years of leadership experience, including 23 years as a combat arms officer in the U.S. Army. In both his book and his leadership presentation, Oak highlights principles that will benefit today's leaders and inspire the leaders of tomorrow in any profession and at any level of leadership. Oak and I met when I was fortunate enough that he heard about the podcast, what I was trying to achieve, what I was trying to share capture these great leaders and books to to share with my audience. We touch base, learn a bit about each other, and obviously it makes complete sense that I would ask him to join um, me for a conversation here. Uh, and that's when I found out, yeah, that that he's got his book. So let's dive into that. So Oak, thank you so much for joining me. Yeah, well, thanks for having me, John. And what you're doing is so important, uh, getting the message out about leadership. Yeah. Um, it's, it really is, I think, important just because it kind of, it sets the example for how to have conversations about just being curious about each other, learning about each other. You know, the top, that the topic is leadership is amazing, but even first and foremost, just learning about your fellow human being. I mean, I think yeah. we've lost that art of just learning about each other, asking about each other, genuinely being interested in, in what that next person is and what they bring to the table. So I appreciate that so much. So, Oak, the first question I usually ask is, who are you today? So I know you're retired, but obviously you're keeping busy. What what does the work look like that you're doing in your day to day today, these days, I guess? Right. So um, so I did. I retired from the Army in 2009 after 23 years. I ran a food bank for a couple of years um, and then I, I've been a government service officer. I officially retire on Friday from that. Congrats. job. Uh, and then uh, and now it really is about my passion is about getting out and getting my message about servant leadership out to as many people as I can. So I've written the, the first book. I'm starting my second book on I, I'm going to call it Arm Yourself for Success. And we'll talk about how to be successful in that book and then uh, and getting out and speaking to as many people as I can about good leadership and what makes a good leader. Yeah, before we started recording, Oak had said that he'd never been to Connecticut, that he'd been to Maine, Vermont for speaking engagement. So if you hear something that just resonates based on his experience and what he brings to the table for his presentations and or his book, um, I know a lot of listeners for this series, of this series, work across different industries. So just keep that in mind, bringing Oak to uh, Connecticut. I think we can show him what Connecticut's all about. Now, Oak, to get to how you ended up here um, at the at this point in your career, can you give me a sense of, of that career path, beginning with those first steps into whatever your career development was going to be? So typically, was it education, high school, college? Was it right. straight to the military? Was it family? So that, that career path to now, how did that start off? Yeah, so I, I've been a leader, like I said, for over 40 years, and it's really started in high school. I was always the captain of my sports teams. I played baseball, basketball, football in high school. I was student government president, class president, all those things. And that's where okay. it really started for me that I realized I wanted to be a leader. And I really learned. I had a couple good uh, examples of servant leaders, my basketball coach, my high school history 
teacher who I still stay in contact with both of them. Um, and they, they taught me that it wasn't about me as a leader. It was about the people that I had the privilege to lead. And, and so I, I, and then I've had a couple of good mentors in the military that way as well. And then I, I went off to college, uh, played baseball in college, did ROTC, graduated from ROTC at Northern Illinois University, where I met my wife as well. She was an army nurse for eight years. Oh, wow. Um, and uh, why she married me, I have absolutely no idea. <laughs> Don't we all say that? It's, it's like <laughs> but after 36 thing. years, she doesn't have time to find anybody else. She's, <laughs> she's stuck with me, unfortunately, for her. Um, and 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 I had a lot of different leadership positions in the Army that uh, that taught me how to be a leader. And, you know, I, I had some great mentors. And some of those mentors were people that I actually, actually worked for me, not that I worked for. I'm a firm believer you can... You can learn things from the people that you're that you have the privilege to lead just as much as you can from people that you work for. And uh, I was lucky that I had some some great senior non-commissioned officers who worked for me, who taught me some great lessons and helped develop me into the leader that I am. So I, I think, you know, and people always ask me, so why did you choose to go in the mil be a leader in the military rather than in the civilian world? And for me, it really was I, I, growing up. I. My father never finished the eighth grade. My mother never finished the 10th grade. Now they got their GED eventually. But, um, but you know, he, here I was, I, I got to be, I got to go to college. I got a bachelor's degree. I have a master's degree. I, I retired a Lieutenant Colonel in the army. Nowhere else in the world do I happen. And I've been in 45 countries on five continents. I can just tell you that that is a unique experience uh, opportunity that America offers people. And I always felt like it was my responsibility to make sure that the next generation had the same opportunities and could make the same choices that I made. Oh, so when it comes to leaning towards the military, what did the family history look like? Was there influence from your family history at all going into the military? What was like that turning point that did guide you in that direction? Not very much. My father spent two years in the army during the Korean War. Never really talked about it. Never really, never really wanted me to go in the military. <laughs> and yeah. uh, but I had two uncles. One, both served in Vietnam. One was in the Navy, and one was in the Army. And uh, heard a couple of their stories. But it really was just that I, I believed that it was my, I believe in service, and that's why when I left the army. You know, I didn't jump into the corporate world. I had some offers to do that, but I still felt that it, service was the the thing that I'm about. And so that's why I went to the food bank and ran the food bank for a couple of years because um, it really fit, fit my mantra of service. So um, not that you can't serve in this in corporate world as well, but but that just it felt right for me to go run a food bank. And then, uh, then they offered me to come and work uh, doing recruiting for Army ROTC. And so, I, again, that's service, helping the next generation of leaders, not only for the Army, but for the nation, help develop them, get them commissioned, and get them on their path to, to being a, a servant leader. That idea for you of service, of servant leadership, did that, I'm assuming it evolved during your military career, but did you see that kind of... Uh, behavior, that kind of attribute from anybody around you growing up that kind of led you down that path, that mindset? Because I mean, that's really a mindset. How do I put this? That's really, I don't know. When somebody brings up service in their work or servant leadership, typically, most often I find that it's because they've seen it modeled somewhere, maybe in their youth. Was there right. anybody like that for you where you saw somebody doing that? I mean, you, you, you've mentioned that you've had mentors that were um, your superiors, your subordinates. Was there anybody in there that kind of modeled that for you, that put you on that path of really serving? Yeah, I think, number one, my, the first example I had was, was my basketball coach in high school, uh, Coach Nitzwicky. And uh, he realized that it wasn't just about developing us as basketball players and developing a good team, but it was about develop, developing us as good young men 
that we're going to go out there and be pro uh, productive members of society and good fathers and good good people in the world. And so he was the first one that really did that for me. And Coach Schind or Mr. Schindler, who was my high school history coach or a history teacher, which is why I majored in history in college because he had such an influence on me. Um, he was another one that, that really did um, show th that it was about other people. It wasn't about him. And he really took the interest in people uh, to help develop them, not only teach them history, but help develop them as a, as a person. And he was a Vietnam vet as well. And I heard a couple of his stories as well. So those were the first two. And then I had some in the army who were servant leaders. I also had those authoritarian micromanaging do as I tell you leaders. We yeah. all had those people and nobody ever wants to work for them. You hate it. <laughs> yeah. But I had some great guys, some great leaders who uh, kind of took me under their wing for whatever reason and were mentors to me. And they, it seemed like those that I gravitated toward were the ones that were ser servant leaders, not the other ones. Oh, what was your, did you mention what your master's degree was in? Uh, I got it in history and leadership. Okay. Okay. Now, Oak, just considering everything you shared, does it make sense that who you were as a kid, that this is what you would be doing now? Not, yeah, I think not the path, but who you, your personality as a kid, like what, what of your personality as a kid comes out in your work today? How do you reconcile those? If at all? Yeah, my father, no doubt about it. Um, you know, and good and bad. I, you know, he gave me some good examples and he gave me some bad examples. And I, you know, I, I always tell people you can learn things from bad examples just as much as you can from good examples. Absolutely. You know, you put it in the back of your mind say, yeah, I'll never do that. Um, but my father taught me a couple things as a kid that I think have really stood the time for me and helped me develop into the person I am. Number one, he was a firm believer that winning was important that, uh, you know, you always tried to be the best you could be at whatever it was you were doing. And one of the things he told me one time, I, I was a, I was, I think I was a Lieutenant in the army and I got a job that I really didn't want. And I was kind of whining and complaining to him on the phone. And he said, listen to me, son. He said, I don't care if they tell you to be, to go sweep the floor in the motor pool, be the best floor sweeper the army has. He says, you, 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 you be, do the best you can do at whatever job you get. And he, growing up, he had this rule. He called it the 75% rule. And he said, son, if you can't do something better than 75% of the people doing it, then you need to do one of two things. You either need to figure out how to get better at it, or you need to go do something else because obviously it doesn't matter to you. And, and I lived by that rule grow, growing up and still live by that rule. And I taught it to my kids and hopefully they'll teach it to my grandkids. And I'm trying to teach it to my grandkids, but you, you ought to want to be the best at whatever you do or go do something else. Cause obviously it doesn't matter to you. Oh, I'm curious just with your military experience, your leadership work, and this isn't one of the questions I usually ask, but as a grandfather, how, how do you, it's not all about teaching them growth and development. You know, you want to have, um, fun with them you want to sure. be there for them i don't know how old they are but are they old enough where you can have conversations where they're asking you questions that play into that vein of leadership of service of just kind of who they are as a person do you ever see that come up even yeah, if it's so, even if it's like a four or five year old like there's a way to put these is. ideas you know plant those in a conversation how Absolutely does it come up for you is. if at all so so my granddaughter's uh, she's going to be 10 here soon. And my grandson, one of my grandsons is six and the other one's three. So, um, the nine, the 10 year old, the six year olds by my daughter, the three year olds by my son. So, um, I, I, I take every opportunity I can to, uh, to try to teach them the right way to do things, to do things right. Uh, cause I think that's the number one thing is, you know, if, if you go into a situation and you try to do what's right, then you usually come out. Okay. Now that doesn't mean that I I'm always that way. Cause I, that I'm always trying to teach them things. Cause I, 
Yeah. I have yeah. earned the right to be a grandfather. Yeah, and, <laughs> exactly. And yeah. I tell people all the time, the only thing better being a dad is being a grandfather. Yeah. And I, I'll give you an example. Uh, I would, I don't know, probably a year and a half, two years ago, I was at my daughter's house and I get up early, too many years in the army and working on farms as a kid. Can't sleep in. So I'm, I'm up early. I'm sitting out on the sofa. It's about six o'clock in the morning. My grandson comes out and he sits down right next to me. And I said, so Bryce, what do you want for breakfast? And he says, Papa, dude, I want ice cream. I said, done. <laughs> so I got a big bowl of ice cream. We're sitting there eating it on the sofa. My daughter comes out and says, Dad, what are you doing? I said, look, I'm just an old man trying to get to heaven. If he wants ice cream at <laughs> 6 o'clock in the morning, he gets ice cream. Yeah. It's amazing how many times my generation or, or one generation has to ask their parents, what are you doing when it comes to their kids? Yeah. Like if if I was doing this as a kid, you would have had me like in my room or you would have. It's just amazing how grandparents evolve. Um, yeah. yeah, just your perspective and and just your your insights in the world and just enjoying it, like you said. Right. Deserve, well, you know, she you said know? to me, she said, Dad, you are not the same man who raised me. I said, you're absolutely right. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's I love that that dynamic. It's incredible when that happens. It's so funny. Um, Oak, how do you how do you define since you're in leadership? You've been in the military. Um, I can get a sense for what you believe when it comes to leadership. But what is your definition of leadership? What does it look like? What is great leadership? Yes. Yeah, so, so I'm a firm believer. Like we've talked about in servant leadership, and to me, what I what I always tell you know. Like, I've had my hand in producing commission, helping to commission over 500 lieutenants into the army. And I tell every one of them, every chance I get, I say it is being a leader is not about you. And it is all about you. And they always say, well, Colonel McCullough, how can it be all about me and not about me? I said, well, it's not about you in what title you get or the privileges you get or that you get better pay and you live in a nicer house i said look you get leaders generally get those things and that's great as long as that's not the reason you want to be the leader if that's the only reason you want to be the leader go do something else you're never going to be any good at it it is all about you and how you empower the people that you have the privilege to lead to be better people and to be the best version of themselves and how you run your organization. Are you one of those that micromanage or are you one of those that lets people do the things that they have the talent, skills and knowledge to do? And so to me, it's all about taking care of the people that you have the privilege to lead. It, if you start with that, everything else kind of falls into place. Now, I, I also get people who say, well, I don't want to, I don't like the idea of being a servant leader because I don't want people to walk all over me. And I would say, I mean, we've known each other for a very short time. I don't think you figure out that anybody walks all over me. That's not what servant leadership is. They don't understand what it means. Mm -hmm. Being a servant leader means you are going to have to make people do things that they don't want to do because it's in their best interest. And I always use the example, you know, I, I many times when I had, a, had training that we had to do, I would say, okay, here's the standard we got to meet. If we meet it at three o'clock in the afternoon, we get, we're done. If we're still, if we haven't met it at 10 o'clock at night, we're still going to be here till we meet it. And, and, you know, they didn't like that. They didn't like being there till 10 o'clock at night to meet that standard until they realized somewhere down the road that what I have met them, made them meet the standard to may have saved their life at some point, or it allowed them to be more successful at what they were going to do. So I, I think that's the key is that you, you got to really want to take care of the people that you have the privilege to lead. Thank you. That's a, that's a great way to break it down, to look at it. Um, and just that clarification that just because you're a servant leadership, that that's the value that you espouse when it comes to leadership doesn't mean they may think, you know, serve like a server, like you're there waiting on somebody hand and foot, but I view it more, yeah, as, as serving them in terms of getting them to that next level. I mean, I, I think if if you walk away from a group as a leader, hopefully the time that you've spent, you've spent making them better leaders. That's right. I always think, like your, your father said, it. like if you can't make it better than it is now, which is a result of you doing a better job than others, it's like 
eh, you're really in the right spot. I think leaders have that responsibility, not just to carry out the work they're doing, but that when you step away, when you get promoted or when you leave, when you separate, are these people better off for having known you? So I, I love that idea of servant leadership. Well, I, I'll tell you, Master Sergeant David Powell, who worked for me when I ran my ROTC program a few years ago, and I say he worked for me, he was probably a better leader than I was. Um, we were talking one day about the importance of what we were doing, producing that next generation of leaders, not only for the army, but for the nation, because at some point you're going to take the uniform off one way or the other, you're leaving the army and you're going to, then you're out there in the civilian world, passing those leadership lessons on to, to other people. And we were talking about that important job we were doing. And he said, you know, sir, great leadership handed down from generation to generation is what develops great nations. And I thought, wow, what a powerful quote. I wish I could take credit for that, but I can't. And I thought the most powerful part, the most powerful part of that quote is that you can take that words nations and you can substitute anything you want for it. Family, business, sports team, food bank, hospital, university, yeah. doesn't matter because every organization, I don't care what it is, needs good leadership. And that really, I always had that. I always knew that's what I was doing and what my job was, but that just kind of cemented it for me. And from that day on, every office I've ever had has a sign that I had made that says that exact quote on it and it hangs on my wall. Yeah, I think that can't be overstated. I just, I've always appreciated and loved that idea that if you're a leader, like when you step away, when you move on, have you made these these people better workers, better uh, soldiers, better whatever it may be, and as a result of that, better people? Because I think yeah, I agree. I think how you treat people in the structure of the military, in the structure of an organization, in the structure of uh, a food bank, ripples into how they are. As you said, when um, when people retire from the military, it ripples into who you are as a civilian or just your everyday person. So. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah, and I think the other part of that is that a lot of leaders forget is the responsibility of being a mentor. Um, you know, I, I was lucky I had some great mentors in my life that have helped me throughout. And, and it's your responsibility then to make sure you're mentoring the next group of leaders that are coming up. Um, and so I think that, you know, when I walk, when I go around and I talk to companies, talk to organizations, I talk to leaders, I say, so who are you mentoring? And if they tell me nobody, then I question whether or not they're really a leader. They might be a boss, but they're really not a leader because leaders produce ah, more leaders. Such a good point. Yeah, so such a good point. Don't, don't underestimate the power of being a mentor. And, and I, as I talk to young men and women who are just starting out as leaders, I always tell them you need to have a mentor. And if nobody is stepping up to be your mentor, then go find one. Yeah, I promise you there's somebody out there that would love to be your mentor. Yeah, absolutely. That Yeah, that's the same thing I've said to students um, when they've talked about, um, I think I, I went back for an alumni event and students in my the program that I had been in asked about how to network, how to get out there. Um, this is the best time for networking in history. I mean, oh, you absolutely. have access, look, look, look at you and I, I mean, Look at the way me, we met um, online. You saw what I was doing. I, we talked by by email, um, talked before this conversation, and you're in Daytona Beach. I'm in Connecticut. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. Like this never would have happened, you know, 20 years ago. This right. this easily. Um, so now's the opportunity. Now you have access to almost anyone. Um, especially the way, for instance, LinkedIn, um, you can see who's commenting on your connections post. Uh, I've reached out to people. People have reached out to me. Hey, I see this is what you do. And we both know so-and-so. Do you mind if we have a virtual coffee? Now is like the time where you can pick anybody's brain. And I've always said anybody worth their weight in gold will always take the time um, to just sit down, especially with somebody who's younger, who's trying to figure things out. But I think they'll sit down with anybody who's curious about that, the, the work that they do. You know, there are right. some people that are going to keep it close to their chest, but you'd be surprised. I told the students how easily if somebody wants to do great work in their life, 
if you ask them just, Hey, can I ask you a couple of questions? They will make time for you. Absolutely. So you know, it, just paying I, I it saw, forward, as you said, I, I just, I saw something it was on LinkedIn. Actually, I saw a, a little thing and it said, by blowing out somebody else's candle, doesn't make yours burn any brighter. And, you know, we, we, I think a lot of people have forgotten that, it, that, you know, it results do matter and, and you are judged by other people mm -hmm. against other people who are doing the same thing you do, but that doesn't mean that both of you can't be successful. And, and it really is our responsibility to help that next generation be as successful as, as we are or a peer that's struggling. Uh, because yeah. the team is only as strong as the weakest link. And so if you're on a team and somebody's struggling, you, it, it's your responsibility to help yeah, that person yeah. if they're willing to learn and willing to get better. Absolutely. I agree. So, Oak, why don't we jump into the book? Why don't you um, give us a little background on the book, how the book came to be, if you could. That's, a, that's an interesting story. You know, I, I wanted to write that book for many years. Um, and it really is just a compilation of my speeches, my talks on, on leadership. And obviously, in a 45 minute hour long talk, you can't talk about everything. So it was I just took all of the things that I can talk about. And I do uh, at different talks and I put it in a book. And but I always wanted to write. it. And my wife and I and her mom and two people who live in the condo here with us uh in the same building we went to a an event at the catholic church our catholic church um it was a mo it was kind of a combination motivational speaker how do we revitalize the catholic church and get people to come back and the guy who was was uh doing it was jonathan fanning i don't know if you've ever heard of anything he's done but he's an unbelievable speaker un unbelievable and so it was a three hour long event. Obviously he didn't speak for three hours. He spoke for, you know, 45, 40, 45 minutes. And then we took a break, did some things, but he did that three different times. And every time he took a break, I went up and picked his brain because he was doing what I wanted to do. He was out talking about leadership and about motivating the next generation. And he was giving me some great advice. And then after the last time, last session, we talked and we kind of said goodbye. And then, he started to walk away and he turned around and he said, Oh, have you written a book yet? And I said, no, but I'm thinking about it. And he said, stop thinking about it and write it. And so I went home that night, wrote out the table of contents. Uh, that was the 15th of February, started writing the book, the 16th of February, 2020. And I published it on the 12th of February, 2021. Wow. And, and so, I guess I just needed permission to do it. I, I don't know, but he kind of motivated me to do it. And people always ask me, so who'd you write the book for? And I think that's another interest. I think I, in my mind, I was thinking I was writing it for young, aspiring leaders, people who just started out or people who are thinking about being a leader. And I think I did that. If you read the reviews on Amazon, I think I hit that. But I also one of the interesting things, I had a two star Marine Corps general who read it and we just connected on LinkedIn. He found, I don't know how he found the book or whatever, but then he connected with me on LinkedIn and we were talking and he said, you know, Oak, I didn't learn a whole lot of new things in your book. He said, I did learn, learn a few new, new techniques. He said, but what I really took out of your book was this. He said, as I was reading along, I'd read something and I'd think to myself, you know, I used to do that really well and I don't do that so well anymore. Maybe I need to dedicate some time and effort to get back to doing that. And I think that's so important because I don't care how long you've been a leader and how successful you are. There's some things that you kind of fall by the wayside that helped you be as successful as you are. And you just need that little nudge every once in a while to get back to doing those simple things. And that I really that really made me feel good that that uh, that I was able to help that person get back to doing some things that maybe they weren't doing so well anymore. Yeah, when you when you said um, when it can't when it comes to who I wrote it for, you said that's an interesting story. And for a split second, I'm like, well, he could have written it for anybody, you know, because I think those those stories, those lessons are applicable to anybody. Oh, I agree. Um, 
I've always said like little lessons that I give my kids about the way they interact at daycare are applicable to seasoned executives. The language is different. The vernacular is different. Um, the, the stakes are higher. The environment's different, but the lessons are just so applicable, but it is great that somebody that has had that career reads your work. And what's amazing is people are always like, you know, you read so many books, so many of them are leadership and they're obviously leadership, similar topics, similar veins. So why do you read so many? It's like, because everybody puts things in their own words, like That's their right. own tone, their own experience, their own so, story. Exactly. Their own stories. So something that you say, even if it's a chapter on a topic that this other guy knew about, has read about, there may be one sentence where Oak wrote it a certain way based on his own experience. And it just flips the idea on its head and just wakes him up again because of the way that you tell it because of your experience and your story. So it, it, I love when that happens when people are just kind of reminded, especially reminded that, you know, I've been dropping the ball a little. This is a great reminder just to pick it back up and maintain that standard that I always used to have for myself. Right. I agree. And, and, you know, and the other part of my book is, and I, and I did this absolutely on purpose. There is no mention of theory, no leadership theory in my book. I don't even use the word theory. I don't think you can find it in anywhere in the book. It, it's everyday things that everyday leaders can do to improve their leadership skills and empower their people to be better people and the organization to be better. And, and because look, leadership, the principles of leadership haven't changed in 2000 years and nor are they going to in the next 2000 years. Anybody who walks up to me and says, Oak, I figured out this new thing about leadership. I said, get away from me. <laughs> There's nothing being a leader is the things that you have to do to be a leader are not hard. Doing them is hard. Yeah. Day in, day out, always setting the example, all that stuff. That's hard. But the principles are not hard. You know, they're pretty simple. Otherwise, yeah. dumb farm boys like me wouldn't be a leader. Where did you grow up, Oak? Northern Illinois. Okay. Okay. Um, Next question is, what can you provide a general overview of the book? So if somebody cracks open the book, what's the path? What's the journey that you take them on? Uh, I don't know. Great example. You said you went home that night after the church um, talk uh, and wrote the table of contents. It's great you brought that up because usually I'm just kind of like, what's the general path? But how did you craft that table of contents? How, how did you determine what you wanted to include, the order you wanted to include it? Just some insight into how you wanted to structure that path for the reader. Yeah. That, so I, 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 again, I just took the presentation that I've been given for 20 something years, all the different ones. And I just kind of combined all the subjects that I talk about and I just started writing them down. I changed the order about halfway, you know, a couple of times I changed, okay, this chapter needs to go there after I wrote it. And I didn't even write them in the, in the order of the chapters. I didn't, I think I wrote chapter one last. Um, so it, what, whatever inspired me on that day, in some days I wouldn't even write, I'd write on in three different chapters. Um, you know, I write a little bit of that chapter and a little bit of this chapter. So whatever was coming to me at that time. But really, I'm, I, I try to walk the person through the key things that leaders have to do if you want to be a good leader. And the first thing I start with is servant leadership, because I think that, is the baseline. If you're not a servant leader, in my opinion, you've kind of missed out on what being a leader really is. And then I just talk about some, some of the principles. I talk about the importance of communication in all forms of communication, written, verbal, nonverbal, uh, listening, which I think is one of the things that most people in this world today don't do a good job at. Huge, how important huge. And I talk about learning, you know, networking, like we talked about, learning about the people that you have the privilege to lead in ways, good ways to do that, easy ways to do that. I talk about team building, building a culture, having a vision and a plan and how to communicate that to people. I, I talk about problem solving and decision making, S things that leaders need to do if you want to be a good leader. And 
unfortunately, I look out there in the world today and I see lots of people who can't make a decision, lots of leaders who can't make a decision or are making very poor decisions. Um, so, and then I talk about professional development, how important it is that, uh, that you not only have a professional development for yourself, but you have one for the people that work for you. Um, and so I, I just kind of walk them through those principles and I use my own stories uh, or stories of people that I have worked with uh, to help bring, bring home that principle to a usable, to show how it, how it really does work. Is there a particular story that you could share with us, one that jumps out, just to kind of give an example uh, to, to the viewer and the listener about how the story kind of leads to, to um, whether it's an exercise or just a lesson or a takeaway? Is there something that you can share with us? I, th I think one of my favorite stories in the book is um, I'm, I'm talking about how to use the people on your team, how to use their knowledge, their skills, their abilities. And I, and I use this as an example. I was a brand new second lieutenant, showed up at, my, at the unit. There were three brand new lieutenants who showed up that day. I was one of them. There was only one platoon leader spot. The other two were going to go be a staff officer for the first part of their career. And everybody wants to be a platoon leader. Every infantry officer wants to have you know, 32 guys that they're in charge of um, to, to do what it was that we trained to do. And so I got selected for whatever reason, I got selected to be the platoon leader. So my company commander takes me out to my platoon, who's already out at a range. And all morning, they had been practicing a dismounted live fire exercise, you know, where soldiers are running across an objective and bullets are landing, live bullets are landing five, 10 feet in front of them as they run across the objective. And so they've been doing that all morning, practicing it. And so I got there right around noon and I got to meet my platoon sergeant, my senior NCO that is kind of second in charge. And never forget Sergeant First Class Penson, six foot six, 250 pound Southern boy from Mississippi. And he grabs me by the shoulder and he says, come on over here, sir, let's go have lunch. And so we both grabbed an MRE and we go sit underneath a tree and we're sitting there and he said, you know, I remember I'm 24 year, 24 year old lieutenant. And he, and he says to me, he says, sir, you're in charge. You're the boss. We will do things however you want to do it. He said, but, but let me remind you that I've been in the army for 23 years. He'd been in the army almost as long as I'd been alive. <laughs> he said, my job is if you're going to screw something up is to tell you that. He said, I've seen things done every which way they can be done. He said, if you still want to do it that way, we'll do it that way. You're the boss, but it's my job to let you know that you're making a mistake. Yeah, I like and that. And so I remember, I don't know, five, six months later, I came into him and I said, hey, Sergeant Pinson, I want to do this. And he looks at me and he says, do you really want to do that? <laughs> and I said, well, I thought I did, but maybe not. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, use the people, the talents, the skills, the abilities. Because you don't have all the answers. I don't care how long you've been the leader. Yeah. You I love don't that. have all the answers. Use I, them. I love that story just because I think a lot of people where they trip up in leadership, formal leadership, uh, is when they, yeah, they, they think they have all the answers. I was promoted into this position. I was hired into this position because I have all the answers. So all that experience of all the people that are under that person just kind of go falls by the wayside. It gets underutilized, not utilized at all. Uh, instead of just, I don't know, seeing the leader as the facilitator. I, I see the resources from my vantage point. I look across all the people. I see who can do what. But I love the fact that he he said, listen, you're the boss. I respect that. Um, if I see something that from my experience I know maybe won't work or I know doesn't work, then I'll say it to you. If you still want to do it, fine. I, I love that there's that respect right? that he could pull you aside and say that. Um, maybe somebody might have thought that's insubordination, but that to me is respect where it's like, I realize you're the leader. Absolutely. But part of my responsibility too is, is to share if I, if I see something that you may not. So I think there has to be, there has to be that mutual respect back and forth. 
I, to, I to, to call and, each and other I, out in a certain way. I, I absolutely agree. And I will tell you, I give Sergeant for First Class Penson, who retired a master sergeant, unfortunately, he died a few years ago. Um, and I give him a lot of credit for helping to develop me into the leader that I became. Um, you know, I, I watched him as a leader. And, and again, probably as good or better leader than I was. Um, and, and I and I learned a lot of lessons from him. And, and, and that kind of set the tone for me throughout my career in the Army that I was going to use the people who I had the privilege to lead. I was going to use their skills, their knowledge, their ability. I had a boss who retired a four-star general, so obviously way smarter than me. And he told me one day, he said, oh, leadership is on a scale. He said, on this end of the scale, you got that micromanaging, authoritarian, do as I tell you to do leader that nobody wants to work for. And we all have. <laughs> and on this end of the scale, you have chaos and Attila the Hun. He said, you want to be as close to chaos as you feel comfortable. Hmm. He said, and this is why. He said, because that's where creativity happens. That's mm -hmm. where you're using other people's knowledge, other people's skills, other people's abilities, and you're letting them do it the way they would do it. Will they do it exactly the same way you would have done it? Maybe not. But who yeah. cares? As long as they do what you ask them to do, they get the job done. They accomplish what you want them to do. He said, and the way you get there is very simple. You train them to a standard. You trust them. And the reason you can trust them is because you've trained them to that standard. And then you give them the authority to make it happen. And then you get out of their way. He said, you can never give away responsibility. That is yours as the leader. Your name is always the one on the blame line. But you can give away as much authority as you as you want, and you should give as much of it away as you can for them to accomplish the task that you're asking them to do. And if you do that, you will be amazed at what they give you. Oh, I'm curious. Um, I had referenced in the bio your presentation. So how has the book shifted? Uh, because I, from what you're telling me, the book is a compilation of the various talks that you've given me. So how has the book now coming out? How has that shifted your presentation? How has it changed the way you present? Um, what does that look like now, your presentation, the talk that you give? Is there a signature talk that you give? So so there is. I, I, I pride myself in that I've never, I don't think I've ever given the exact same presentation twice. So what I generally do if somebody asks me to come talk is I say, okay, here are the 15, 20 things I can talk about. You pick, depending on how long they want me to talk, 45 minutes to an hour and a half, I say, you pick five, six, seven, whatever it is. And then I'll throw in one or two. But I'm also one of those guys that I tell them, I don't want to come 15 minutes before the presentation, give my presentation and then leave. Mm. I want to be there and be involved. I want to be there the night before and be at the social event and talk to people that I'm going to talk to the next day. And I've actually changed the things that I was going to talk about based on conversations that I had the night before, things that they had concerns about, things that were important about them, things that they felt weren't going well. Maybe I wasn't gonna talk about that tomorrow, but I went back to my room that night and said, okay, that's what they're interested in. Let's throw that in and I'll take this out. So uh, I think the base of it is pretty much generally the same. I always talk about servant leadership mm -hmm. and I always talk about uh, communication and I always talk about uh, building, getting to know the people in your organization. Those are things I always try to talk about. And most people want that. That's part, generally most people want those things. Yeah. And then I, I throw in what they want to talk about and what I want to talk about. I like that because <laughs> I find myself doing the same thing is just really getting to know who I'm talking to and not just coming in with the boilerplate uh, presentation, coming in, leaving, uh, just making myself available before and after. So I like that because it, it shows that you really do have a stake in the lessons that you're trying to put out there. Uh, well, oh, and, it, and, and you're there for them. You're not there yeah. for yourself. At least you should. Exactly. Be. Exactly. Okay, so why would you not want to give them what they want? Yeah. Oak, what, when it comes to writing this book, how did how did it change you? How did your thinking evolve? You've been carrying out these leadership lessons for decades now. Uh, but I'm, I'm thinking that even with you, after so many you know decades of doing this stuff, 
maybe something might have shifted in your thinking or you saw things um, a different way. So did anything change for you in the process of writing this? And you were covering your stories, you were covering your presentations from the past, but did something change at all or or did it elevate your thinking or change your lens on any of this? Uh, absolutely. I, I think it was, you know, reflection as a leader is so important. And I think, you know, I, I have built that into my daily routine, but this made me even reflect more. And just like the two-star Marine Corps general who said, you know, I saw things that maybe I wasn't doing so well. I, it, I saw the same thing. You know, I, I knew from past experiences that this was important, but maybe I just had slipped a little bit. Maybe I wasn't doing that quite as well as I used to. And, and, and so it, it kind of made me reflect back on, am I, am I really doing all the things that I'm saying that leaders need to do? Am I doing them as well as I can be, or can I do better? And, and it really did make me reflect back on not only what I have done, but what I am doing today. And, and I think that that made me even more, I think it made me a better leader, but it also made me even more passionate to get out there and talk to people to pass on some of those lessons and the importance of them. What uh, you had mentioned that you're working on your next book. What can you give us a little bit of insight into what that's going to cover? Yeah. So I, I, the other, I do another presentation, another talk on success, and I, I call it Arm Yourself for Success. And, and I'm just going to talk about some things that will help you, will increase your possibilities of being su successful. I mean, let's be honest, there's no cookie cutter solution to being successful. That's not life. You know, you can yeah, do all yeah. everything, you can do a bunch of things and not be successful. But I think there are some things that you can do that will help you be successful. Um, I, I talk about goals and how to set goals and accomplish goals. I talk about uh, c communication will be in there again, because I don't care what profession you, you are in, whether you're a leader or just a worker bee, you have yeah. to be able to communicate if you want to be successful. That's just the way it is. And I, and I, I talk about developing some self-discipline, some motive, how to motivate yourself and others, because some of your success is de determined by other people around you as well. Absolutely. absolutely. I talk about, um, about habits, the importance of habits and how to develop good habits and break bad habits. Um, cause we all, we are all creatures of habit and anybody who tells you they are not is lying to you. <laughs> we are all creatures of habit. Yeah. Um, and, and some of those habits need to be broken and, and we need to develop good habits. Um, so, and I'm, I talk about networking, the importance of getting to know the people that, that, um, that you're working with or are working for you or you are working for and good ways to do that. So I think it, it really is, it's kind of a offshoot of the leadership, mm -hmm. but it's also for anybody. It isn't just for leaders. I don't care what level you are. There are certain things that if you want to be successful, you need to be able to do. And Oak, because you say, obviously, and I agree with you that success isn't cookie cutter. What is your definition of success? Yeah, I, I get asked that a lot. And I always tell people, your definition of success will generally change as you get older, as you move from position to position, from profession to profession, whatever it is your definition of success will always will probably always change. I think the baseline for my success, my definition of success is that I am a good person and I am helping other people be better people. Um, and then anything else that I want to accomplish that certainly has changed throughout my life. What, what, what I wanted to end up as or accomplish has changed based on, on life, some things you don't get to do. So that may change what your definition of the success is in that profession you're in. So I, I think if you can have a baseline, what it is that really makes you a person, a successful person, then you can go into whatever your success in the profession or the job that you have. And that's the part that will change. The baseline shouldn't change. Oh, what for the for the book that we're discussing? Um, 
the one that you've already published, what, how would you sum it up? What do you want people to take away in a brief statement? How would you sell it to somebody um, who may not think that it's for them, but what is, what is that value proposition that you want them to take away? So I, th I think the, the main thing is that it is it is everyday things that leaders at all levels can do. And even aspiring leaders, if you want to if you want to be a leader someday, there's some things in there. But, you know, one of the things that has really made me happy is that I've had lots of people who have re read it, who say they keep it on their desk at work and they use it as a reference or a workbook. And if they come across something they'll pull up my book and they'll take a look at how, you know, reread the story that I talked about, about what it is that they're facing. And, and that, that has helped them throughout their, uh, their daily life at work. And, and that, that, that really does make me feel good because that is kind of what I wanted it to be. So a, a blueprint, again, there's no guarantees of being yeah, yeah, success, yeah. but, if you want to be a good leader, there are certain things that I think you need to do. And, and I kind of give, give them some ideas of how to do it and, and why it's important that they do those things. You know, one of them is how, how do you have that hard conversation with somebody who's not meeting the standard? Yeah. So I kind of lay out some, some ways to do that, to make that conversation a little bit easier. And, and I've had people who have actually said that they've used it and it actually worked. So. Yeah, I love uh, just the mention that you made a couple minutes ago of just the everyday things that you can do. Um, much like I, this has come up on LinkedIn, it's come up on a talk that I gave yesterday or an interview I gave yesterday. Um, and it's come up in, in these conversations and this series where whether it's leadership, whether it's success, whether it's your goals, the monumental doesn't have to happen right away. That it's like everyday things, that it's everyday actions, everyday gestures. And I think leadership is the same thing, like where you don't Absolutely. wait until there is a project or there is a mission or there is an operation or there's something that needs to be delivered. Even if the thing, if, even if things are quiet, there's no mission, there's no project, there's no deliverables, there's no due dates that leadership is still there. I think it's in the right. everyday everyday moments that we create, whether it's leadership, whether it's success, again, whether it's goals. Um, I think people stop themselves because they believe that everything has to be a seismic shift where it's like the little things in the everyday that they should stop and realize that they have more power than they give themselves credit for if they just ask questions, if they're curious, if they learn to communicate. So I, my hope is anybody that even if you're not in a leadership position, even if you don't see yourself as a leader, this kind of gets you to, in that mindset because you realize it's the little everyday actions that you can take that set that stage for your your growth later. That's right. And and I think, you know, even people who don't think they're in a leadership position, again, leadership isn't a title. And lots of people who don't think they're in a leadership position, somebody's watching them. They are going to have influence on somebody and they're going to inspire somebody by something they do yeah even if they're not in a leadership position so you know on, on and on the flip side of that i'm a firm believer that leaders if you are a leader leaders want to lead that's that's what we do and i want to be the leader all the time i don't care what what's going on i want to be the leader now i know when i come home and I walk in my house, I know I'm not the leader anymore. Okay. There's a yeah, reason yeah. I've been married for 37 years, almost 37 yeah. years. But when I walk out the next morning, I want to be the leader. And, you know, good leaders don't pass up opportunities to be a leader. Even if you don't have the title of being a leader, yeah. you still can lead. Yeah. I love what you mentioned about your example. That That's another thing that's huge for me telling students is it's not just your actions. It's not just your, your, the words you use, it's not your uh, guidance, it's not your uh, direction. It's not only that that people are looking at, they're watching you from a distance. Absolutely. So the leadership that they see isn't necessarily just when you're interacting with them. They're paying attention when you're talking with other people. They're paying attention all when, when all the time, all the time. I've said it you know, in the past. I mean, it's not groundbreaking research or anything, but 
people are building profiles. Every little thing that you do, they're adding to that folder. Okay, this is, I like what they did here. I don't like the tone they used here. I saw a little bit of disrespect here. Okay, they're giving me more flexibility here. So I love that you point out that it's your example. And I would just stress that it doesn't have to be your direct example. They're watching you from a distance. They people, are. you know, I think for better or worse, especially with technology nowadays, um, public companies, I mean, you hear about the leaders in those companies, the CEOs, what they're, what they're saying, what their emails are saying, the tones that they're setting. So it's powerful just to consider somebody's always paying attention. Even if you, even if they don't say anything, people are paying attention to how you're um, navigating life, navigating work, navigating your leadership and leadership development. I absolutely agree. And another thing my father always kind of beat into me as a, as a young man was he, he always used to say to me, son, if you say one thing and you do another, it is your actions that will be believed, not what you said. And so he, he you know, he just kind of set the example, set, set, set the stage that it is your example. You are, I always tell you, especially these young men and women that are going out to be leaders for the first time. I said, you are that moral, ethical, and lawful compass of that organization that you are taking over. And I always use the analogy that they're just like your kids. They will do what you let them do. If you hold them to a standard and you make them do good things, they'll do good things. If you let them do bad things, they will do bad things. It really is up to you and it starts with you. You can't hold somebody to a standard that you aren't willing to live to live up to yeah, yourself. Amen. Amen. And I that's see a, that a lot in one. today's world where leaders are hold, trying to hold people to standards that they're not willing to live up to. And it doesn't work. It just doesn't work. Yeah, absolutely. Before I forget, and I always I tend to forget this with my author guests. We're obviously covering your book, Oak, but if there were a book that I asked you to come back to speak to me about the same kind of theme, um, someone else's book that you've read that's had an impact on you, do you have a sense of what book that would be? Absolutely. I, I get asked that question a lot. What's my favorite leadership book? And hand, there's two. One, and it always surprises them, the number one book has nothing to do with the military. My favorite leadership book, hands down, is John Wooden on leadership. Ah, uh, yeah. And, and the reason is because, again, John Wooden understood that it wasn't just his job to develop great basketball teams. Obviously, he did that. Yeah. <laughs> Six yeah. national championships in a row. His, he realized his job was to make good young men and make them great citizens and fathers and people out there in the world. And he did a great job. You can tell people, the people who were uh, on his team had, have great respect for him, had great, unfortunately, he passed away soon, not too long ago as well. And then my second favorite book is, uh, it's On Courage. And it talks, and it, that is a military book, and it's the Israeli military. And it's the battalion commander who was in charge of the Golan Heights during the 1973 war. And he talks about all the different problems that he came up with. And even though it's in the military context, they are still, you know, it's, it's about trust. It's about making decisions. It's about solving problems. It's about using all the talents and skills and abilities of the people that are working for you. So it is certainly could be used in any profession it just happens to be said in a military uh scenario yeah i love that when somebody can um share lessons from one industry but you can kind of extract those lessons for for life or for other work for other industries and uh wooden's book on leadership was covered here uh probably 15 episodes ago so i got I haven't read it, but my guest was sharing the lessons from from that book. So it's on my list to get to. Yeah, well, you know, John, I, I, I'm a firm believer that leadership is leadership. It doesn't matter what profession you learned it in. It doesn't matter yeah. where you practiced it. If you because in the end, leadership is about people, yeah. plain and simple. It's not about flow charts. It's not about organizational charts. It's really not even about bottom line. I got it. If you run a business, you got to make money. But that's not 
what leadership is about. Because if you do it right, if you take care of the people that work for you, they're going to be better people. They're going to be better employees. They're going to make the company better. And in the end, you're going to make money anyway. Yeah. Yeah. And you're going to get your next promotion. You're going to get your next pay raise, but you're doing it for the right reasons. You're not doing it because you're greedy or selfish. You're doing it because you're helping other people. Absolutely. I agree. Oh, what are you up to these days? Is there anything that you want to share that I might've missed that you want to share with this audience, anything at all? that you want to put out there yeah i'm just i'm just out there doing speaking engagements i'm going to be in london in two weeks uh talking and then i've got one right down the road here in west palm beach a uh, week after that and uh really that i mean that's really what i want to do at this point get out and talk to as many people as i can to get my message out um about servant leader and why it, being a servant leader and why it's so important yeah, my goal is to get you up to Connecticut at some point. So I'm going to put that out there. I'm going to put that out there into my network uh, on this episode and any chance I get on LinkedIn. So keep a lookout for that. Yeah, I'd love to come up that way. Oak, thank you for sitting down with me for this conversation on your book, Your Leadership Legacy, Becoming the Leader You Were Meant to Be. I appreciate it so much. I appreciate it. Thanks, John. And if there's anything that I might have missed for the listener and the viewer, there's so much to cover, limited time. If there's anything that I missed, reach out. Let me know if you have any questions or you have any ideas of what I should have brought up, points I should have made, whatever it may be. Let me know and I'll reach out to Oak, get some feedback from him. In the meantime, thank you for watching. Thank you for listening and I'll talk to you soon. Take care. Bye.